As with any master, there is always an apprentice, a padawan that walks by their side, learns their technique, seeks vengeance in their honor or just happens to be related and therefore we expect great things. In either case, we have definitely seen this in MMA where a prospect joins a gym and is taken under the wing of a high level athlete. The media get to talk about a new protege and we hope that some of those high level skills have rubbed off. Yeah, the only thing is it doesn't matter how much we want to credential a training camp spent alongside the world's greatest. These proteges have to walk their own path and unfortunately, well, things don't always go as planned. I'm Bailey in from MMA on point and boom, Jocko is back. Guns are blazing and slinging that all natural energy boost. So you get your 10% off using the exclusive code MMA on point. And with that subscription, you get free shipping and you can stock up on your fuel over at jockofuel.com. It's the ultimate pre workout boost. Anyways, more on that later. But for now, here are the 10 worst protege debuts. Number 10, Chael Sonnen. Back in the day, Team Quest was one of the best gyms around. Hey, welcome. Come on in. Matt Linden, Dan Henderson, and Randy Couture had this Olympic credentialed Greco Roman background and they were using it to dominate the early 2000s in the UFC. Linden ran the facility in Oregon, home, of course, to the West Lynn gangster Chell Sonnen. Chell became an All American at the University of Oregon, who he took under his wing and made his protege sharing his UFC experience, Olympic wrestling techniques, and hygiene tips. They even studied the entertainment side of pro wrestling together to see if they could translate anything into MMA, but I'm pretty sure Chell took the ball and ran with that one, though. Ariel, is that camera big enough to take? in the largest arm in Westland, Oregon that has found its way to Houston, Texas, because that thing looks a little bit small. Still, after eight years as a pro, Chael made his debut at UFC 55 against Renato Sabrul, which is not an easy fight by any means. He was on an eight-fight win streak, and they had already fought before. Two years earlier, where Chael had picked up a decision after some weird confusion where Babalu thought it was only a two-round fight. Babalu told Chael his girlfriend wouldn't recognize him after the fight, so they clearly had some unfinished business. Rogan hyped up Chael as the next prospect, given that he was a protege coming out of Team Quest, and Buffer called him Kale, which was nice. I'm sure he loves salad. Kale there was a lot of grappling back and forth, and Chael was literally screaming in pain at the end of the first round when he was caught in a heel hook, but it went to a second, and after more grappling, Sabrul found a triangle choke, and Sonnen lost his debut. Still, regardless of that, as most people will tell you, he had an undefeated career, and did eventually part ways with Matt Linland. Number 9, Mohamed Usman. Given that, at least according to the UFC rankings, Kamaru Usman is currently the number one pound for pound fighter on the planet, if I told you he had a brother that also does MMA, you'd probably get quite excited. And based on what I've learned from stepbrothers about brotherly love, bonding, and garage karate, I can only expect these two train together from birth, bickering, grappling, and hopefully having a large amount of room for activities. Mohammed has actually been smashing the regional professional circuit, picking up three wins in Tachi PF before heading to Titan FC, where he picked up another four victories, taking his record to six and one. Given that, you know, he's the brother of the best pound for pound fighter on the planet and the fact that he was at this point a legit prospect he signed to the pfl to take part in their new season gain some notoriety take on tougher opponents and yes most likely follow in his brother's footsteps and join the ufc only problem is he fought brandon sales another top prospect in what is a very hungry hungry pool of fighters looking to make one million dollars the fight wasn't actually going too badly they kind of both had the same strategy really swing hard and try to time the opponent and yeah unfortunately the guy was fighting did that it was about halfway into the fight and he flattened him with a Hook. Usman survived, but Sales, who's a big boy by the way, started crushing him with a standing guillotine, dropped him again, and by the time he put the rear naked choke on Usman, he was basically done at that point anyway. Yeah, that's a rough BFL debut, but against a big strong guy in Sales, well, I mean, that's a tough fight. Usman has only ever lost once though, in his second fight ever. Yeah, gonna be hard to live up to a nine year unbeaten streak. Number eight, Papi Abedi. Now, if I asked you to name me the most famous Swede in the UFC, I'm sure 100% of you would say the mauler Alexander Gustafsson. And you would be right. His first fight inside the promotion was way back in 2009. Jared Hammond, boom, first round KO. But in 2011, the UFC signed another Swede to the roster, an important training partner, fellow team member, and 8-0 undefeated Papi Abedi. Alex made his debut in the UK. He'd been tearing through the division. By the time Dana was ready to sign another Swede, he had Papi booked to do pretty much the same against Thiago Alves again in the UK. And just like Alex on his arrival, Papi was tipped as the next biggest prospect out of Europe. Papi and Alex trained on the same team, yes, but they were also very close friends as they traveled to Alliance together in the US to work on their wrestling. Papi was a serious judoka, and Alex and Andre Pedaneris helped him develop his striking and transition into MMA. But back to the debut. Yeah, if you know anything about MMA, you'll know Tiago Alves is about as tough as it gets at 170, and I mean, this was after he'd fought GSP for the title, so it's not like he was short on experience or anything. Papi came out swinging and was competitive enough for most of the first 
round, but Alves was just too good, too powerful, and much more composed. He dropped him, unleashed some hellacious elbows, and sunk in the rear naked choke. The Maulers' debut in the UK ended in 40 seconds with Viking-like war cries. Like, objectively, this might be one of the toughest opponents for a debut ever, at least in terms of experience. Number 7. Lance Evans Rashad Evans did it all, winner of the Ultimate Fighter, UFC champion, and he did it whilst undefeated. And while he was on top of the world, his brother Lance was also competing. Was he as good? Well, no, not really, but he still walked in his footsteps anyway and joined the cast for season 8 of the Ultimate Fighter. I mean, how could they not at least give him a call-in for the tryouts in the first episode? I mean, he was a light heavyweight and his brother was, at the time, the light heavyweight UFC champion. He wasn't even the only brother there. Jason Guida, Clay's brother, was also trying out for this season. But as Dana pointed out during the first episode, those are some tough shoes to fill. Even if you've been wrestling together since you could both walk. To be fair, he was fighting Vinny Magalhaes, who's still competing in the PFL, so it's not exactly your bog standard 3 0 Ultimate Fighter tryout. Well, the first round was back and forth, and after it, Evans returned to the corner holding his side. Apparently, he felt like a bone popped out, and so he didn't come out for the second round. So his UFC dream died, he retired 3 3. Later that same year, Rashad lost the belt to Lyoto, and Clay Guida's brother Jason went on to have a 19 and 28 career. It's a funny old sport, eh? Number 6. Baby Fedor I know I've already talked about the sleepy Russian birthplace of the legend that became Fedor Emelianenko, Stary Oskol. And believe it or not, there was actually another MMA talent from the same village. He became his student and was affectionately named Baby Fedor. Ah, adorable, I guess. He wasn't just a protege. This was the kind of master-student relationship that meant they got in saunas together and hit each other with branches. That's some Dagobah swamp shit. In his first two years, he'd gone 5-2 and two with a significant amount of mini Fedor hype behind him. He'd fought exclusively in M1, though, even in the Emelianenko Cup in 2008. But he jumped on board the Affliction Train, who, if you don't know, they were a very short-lived MMA promotion that actually managed to book some of the biggest names at the time before crashing and burning spectacularly. He made his debut in their second card ever, Affliction 2, headlined by his master Fedor taking on Andrei Arlovsky. He actually fought right after Bobby Green as well, so talk about a flashback. Affliction knew exactly what they were doing when they signed him as well, and they literally introduced him as Fedor Emelianenko's protege on the broadcast. Fedor Emelianenko's 20-year-old protege, Kirill Sedelnikov. But this was his first time in the US, and it was a pretty big show. I mean, Fedor was headlining. The point is, it was a step up from the 6,000-seater shows he'd been doing in M1. And he was fighting Paul Brunton who isn't exactly the best fighter in the world, but at this point he was 26 and 10, and baby Fedor, Kirill, this was his seventh fight. It was pretty clear as well that Paul was just smoother on the feet and the damage just started adding up and a couple of more big shots landed in the third round and the poor kid was just kind of battered by the end of it, so Big John stopped it in the third round. Number 5. Bivon Lewis Greg Jackson and Mike Winklejohn have had a lot of protégés, Cowboy, Diego Sanchez, Holly Holm, and Richard before they picked John Jones to be their chosen Padawan, and he had quite possibly one of the best UFC careers of all time. Although, yeah, it was riddled with trials, tribulations, <clears throat> to Rinnable, but on week 8 of season 1 of the Contender series, we met Bavon Lewis, and he told us exactly what was on his mind. And I'm here to shock the world and become a living legend. Oh shit, so exactly like John Jones then. Just, I mean, let's hope for the right reasons, mate. Let me also just say, as Felder points out on the broadcast, Lewis has a very similar build to John. He has a game plan already laid out for him to follow to find divisional dominance. Heck, he even tied up his shorts like him. I mean, it's a better impersonation than James Gallagher's. The contender fight was good. In fact, it kind of proved what we already thought. Okay, this guy looks like John Jones 2.0. And again, Felder was all over that on the broadcast. But given that he only had four pro fights, Dana didn't sign him. He came back one year later against Alton Cunningham. He came out, walked him down, and just hit him with every weapon he could think of. So boom, UFC contract. Still undefeated and hype still building. I mean, heck, the last John Jones protege we saw was Bubba McDaniels in The Ultimate Fighter, who unfortunately didn't really meet the expectations laid out. I mean, even after John gave him the wild card after he got knocked out of the competition, he got finished by Uriah Hall, who also happened to be Bevon's debut fight in the UFC. But lightning can't strike twice, right? Apparently, Terrinable does, though. Way, but um, Anyway, he was debuting against a top 15 guy on a UFC pay per view. Why? Well, it was 232. John Jones was headlining. Yeah, the exact same situation at 271 recently with Izzy and Blood Diamond. But to be honest, Bevon looked great, did all the John Jones things he needed to do, and just as Joe Rogan was explaining what a show he'd been putting on, he got KO'd stiff. Well, it's better than getting DQ'd by Mazagati, to be honest. And hey, big up Uriah Hall, slayer of John Jones' proteges. Number four, Matt Frivola. 
Chris Weidman was a man who certainly steamrolled his way through all his opponents with his wrestling and pressure for at least the early parts of his career. There's another steamroller at the Sarah Longo gym, however, Matt Frivola, and admittedly there aren't a lot of people on the team, but Matt was one of the lucky ones Coach Longo took under his wing. Another protege of Matt Sarah and Ray Longo is of course Chris Weidman. Remember they coached him to take the title from Anderson Silva? Well, Matt has been nestled away with the tightly knit team since he began his jiu-jitsu journey at Sarah BJJ. He actually did an interview with Cage Side Press where he talked about being born and raised on Long Island and being surrounded by the success gave him that extra boost of confidence. Now there's also Law MMA, which is Longo and Weidman MMA, where Chris has seemingly now gone from inspirational teammate to coach. Anyway, he did great on the Contender Series debut to actually get into the UFC, doing as promised, steamrolling Jose Flores, but his actual debut in the UFC, well, he fought Polo Reyes on a UFC fight night and he tried to repeat the game plan, but it clearly wasn't the first time Reyes had dealt with heavy machinery and he put him out cold in one minute. He was all lined up to make an undefeated run to the title like Weidman, but he was more gun-ho than a pre-Poirier Gaethje. Number three, Blood Diamond. Israel Adesanya might be one of the hottest fighters on the planet right now. Not only does he have the world-class kickboxing mystique that comes from only dominating the Asian competitive scene, but he has a world-class team behind him at City Kickboxing. And naturally, anyone he gives an endorsement to will be looked upon with equal anticipation, and I guess in some way, skill level. At 271, Izzy was at the top of the card defending his title, given that it's generally easier to have multiple people from one gym on the same card, especially since they're traveling from New Zealand. We were also going to witness the debut of Blood Diamond and Izzy told us to expect the unexpected, trust. Which apparently and unfortunately meant watching him get wrestled and immediately submitted. Yeah, not exactly how Diamond expected things to go down, I'm sure. Coming from a kickboxing background and only having three fights is basically the same as holding up a white flag and saying, please don't grapple me. And given that his opponent Jeremiah Wells has a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, well, it was kind of a worst case scenario, even if he did have a bit of trouble with judging the size of the octagon. Still, I'm sure he can bounce back. It was only his UFC debut and the guy doesn't have a ton of experience, but it would be nice to think the MMA gods could have looked down, seen Izzy's protege and started him on the same path. But then you remember, this is the UFC octagon. And although we can expect some divine intervention, God left this place a long time ago. Number two, Justin Taffer. Around the time of this video, the Six Nations Rugby has been on in the pubs, and it got me thinking about how transferable is it as a sport to MMA. At the very least, Alexander Volkanovsky and Taito Ivasa both played rugby league before MMA, and more recently following in their footsteps was fellow footy player and protege Justin Taffa. But his idol was Samoan legend Mark Hunt, who also wanted to be a rugby star, long before he started sleepwalking people. Justin started training kickboxing with him until Mark eventually suggested he try out MMA. He said it was the future, and he figured he was already pretty good at spearing people to to the ground, so why not? Mark also apparently taught him about adversity and what it's like fighting on the big stage, which are two things the Super Samoan for sure knows very well. Justin was only 3-0 though when he made his debut, and it was at UFC 243 in Melbourne, Australia, so it's no wonder he got a bump onto the card, but even still, going from regional shows to a fuck-off arena in your UFC debut is definitely gonna rattle a few nerves. It wasn't a mismatch or anything, he was fighting a fellow slugger, Jorgen De Castro, and after banging it out for a few seconds and a ton of clinch work along the fence line, Justin charged Jorgen, who, well, he basically Mark hunted him. One big shot and a smooth walk-off KO. It was picture perfect, and had it had been tougher, I think it may have even brought a tear to Mark's eye. But it wasn't, unfortunately. Certainly a hard debut to live down, but he's still in the UFC, and as Mark knows, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And even Justin's younger brother, Junior, is on the rise now in the world of kickboxing, so maybe we'll see the lineage of the Super Samoan carry on. Number one, Minoru Philippe Kumura. Vandalay Silva was basically a professional KO artist, which I'm not saying is one step away from a hitman, but we all saw how Matilda turned out. So when we found out he had a secret apprentice that was about to make his MMA debut, well, I grabbed my phone and called everyone. <laughs> Okay, so he wasn't that much of a secret. His name was Minoru Philippe Kimura, and he already had a pretty established kickboxing career, which only makes what happened at the Ryzen Grand Prix in 2016 even worse. Vandele Silva got up to some seriously crazy shit in Pride, but one backstage incident that some of you will know is when notorious MMA madman Charles Crazy Horse Bennett started a scuffle backstage with his team, which resulted in him being put to sleep, but not before he popped up and KO'd Vandy. <laughs> 
No kiss. Now, this started a bit of bad blood, as you would expect, but it was way back in 2005. Yet here we were, 11 years later in 2016, about to see the protege and personally trained Kimura take on old rival and general all round shit talker Crazy Horse. And the dude was just clowning right from the announcements, literally talking to the camera, telling Vandy. <laughs> just didn't give a shit at all. Even as the ref gave the instructions, same thing. I mean, even the commentators couldn't help but laugh, and then he KO'd him in six seconds. Yup, Vandy's Padawan ran right at him and got absolutely flatlined. And again, Crazy Horse shouted at Vandy ringside, honestly, you couldn't have storybooked this shit and Kimura never fought in MMA again. I just want to give a big, big shout out to the official fuel of MMA on point, Jocko Fuel. The boys are back to offer you 10% off their brand new pre-workout. It's got healthy levels of caffeine paired with theanine to support a balanced stimulant experience and citrulline and theo bromine which helps promote sustainable muscle pump and stamina so get your 10 percent off using the code mma on point and with your subscription you can get free shipping and you can stock up on your fuel at originmain.com slash jocko fuel for the ultimate boost and go on living your best life and kicking some ass a big shout out to luke taylor for editing this video you can find him and some of his amazing artwork on twitter at cool to me underscore Shout out to Ben Rosette and the excellent music he provided during the intro video. His music can be found on streaming platforms everywhere. There is a link in the description and follow him at Ben Rosette on Instagram and on Twitter. Thank you very much for watching everyone today. Please go ahead and like and subscribe if you did enjoy the content. We upload at least three videos every week for your viewing pleasure. Go ahead and leave a comment below if you want to join in the discussion and follow us on Twitter at MMA on Point and myself at Balian underscore plays. You can now jump in and join the community discord as well if you want to continue the discussion further and I hope you've enjoyed yourselves. I'll see you in the next one.